Hello everybody and welcome to October's first episode of Tomorrow News. A lot of paperwork has been released to do with Starbase and the launch of Starship. We've got some less than exciting news on SLS and then I'll be wrapping it up with some space traffic. So stay tuned as this is your episode of Tomorrow News for the week of October 4th, 2021. We're starting off this week's SpaceX update with some interesting news on Starlink that doesn't actually come from SpaceX themselves. Study author Zach Kazus, who is the director of the Center of Automated Vehicles Research with Multimodal Assured Navigation at Ohio State University, has said that a team of researchers has developed a complex algorithm which can triangulate the signals from six Starlink satellites and then plot a position on Earth with under eight meters of accuracy, which is very comparable with the average accuracy of GPS, which is around five meters. Another experiment they ran was placing an antenna on the University of California, Irvine campus, which they managed to plot within 7.7 .7 meters of its actual position using satellites designed to bring an internet connection to people, not locate them. The Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, has been busy typing up the 151-page draft environmental assessment for the Starship launch vehicle when launching out of Boca Chica. If you fancy a read, the PDF is linked in the data references down below, but for the sake of time and my sanity, I'm only going to be covering the highlights. The part most people will care about is this map of the current and proposed additions to the launch site on the coast of Texas. In green is everything that exists or is currently under construction and in blue are the proposed additions. Most notably there's a new orbital launch pad B, a new tank farm to feed this pad as well as a new landing pad for redundancy in case pad A ever has to go offline. A new dedicated test stand for test tanks is also on the table along with a desalination plant which will remove the salt from seawater allowing it to be used for water suppression around the site. Starhopper has also been repurposed with it being labelled on this map as a water tower. It also says within the document that every Starship or Super Heavy vehicle that is manufactured will go through all the testing they can bear before heading out to the pad to conduct a static fire test. This includes gas pressure testing, liquid pressure testing, cryogenic proof testing, and if at any point in this process something is damaged, a new test vehicle would have to be constructed. Down the road at the manufacturing and production site, SpaceX is proposing to build a new payload processing facility which would be up to 6,760 square meters in size and up to 73 meters tall which is just shy of the high base 80 meter height. The solar farm is also going to be expanded taking it from the capacity to generate 1 megawatt up to 1.7 megawatts. That averages out to around 1,200 homes worth of power per year. Also the current allowances for operational launches is very small compared to Elon Musk's aspirations with the document outlining five launches per year of a super heavy orbital launch. It's thought that this will be changed soon as it really should as with missions that require refueling you're gonna burn through those five launches really really quickly. Three new pull-offs are going to be added onto State Highway 4 which is the road connecting the manufacturing site and the launch site and the public beach. With these new pull-offs the road would no longer need to be closed completely to allow a transporter through as there would be space for the traffic to get past. But for now, residents of the area will have to keep putting up with the road closures as they're just too big to drive around. Here is a new forward section for a super heavy booster, most likely booster number five. You can see two holes for the grid fins to slot into place and the immense scale of it compared to the pickup trucks on the right. This has also now been moved into the high bay. Ship number 20 has successfully completed its cryogenic proof test after being filled up with some very chilly liquid nitrogen. Once the test had been declared a success, the vehicle started venting in order to depressurize. The only thing that needs to be improved is the stuff keeping the tile stuck to the vehicle as a patch you can see here has broken off the nose of the vehicle during testing. A grid fin with a 5 written on it has been spotted at the manufacturing plant so it is very safe to assume that this grid fin is going to be installed on the booster 5 forward section that we saw earlier. The nose cone for ship 21 looks like it is nearing completion with the thermal protection system and a barrel section has also been constructed and placed right in front of the tent door with some tiles installed on that as well. And to make matters more exciting a flap also coated with tiles has just been installed on the side of the section. 
A Booster 6 part has been seen with this common dome section being photographed through the fencing. There has also been a delivery of a new booster thrust puck which I think is for booster 6 however it could be used for booster 5 if necessary. And apart from three new Raptors arriving, nothing else has really been happening over the last few days. It is starting to feel a little bit warmer however, as the orbital flight test doesn't feel that far right, because it isn't. Testing has started, which means only one thing, this is actually going to happen. Even though they returned to Earth over two weeks ago, the crew of Inspiration4 have still been busy as last week they returned to SpaceX's headquarters in Hawthorne, California to be surprised with these fabulous Dragon astronaut wings. They really do look magnificent. NASA's space launch system has arguably become famous for two things, the fact it's over budget and the fact it's been delayed time and time again. The good news this week is that more SLS news is coming soon as we should be told a firm date for the launch of Artemis 1 in the not too distant future but the bad news is that this date is most likely to slip to next year. I hope that this shift is the last shift for a launch date but as history will tell us it might not be. However theoretically with all the parts starting to come together in Cape Canaveral it should be the last substantial delay. Fingers crossed. I've only got two launches to show you this week but there has also been some ISS activity so there's plenty to cover. A bit of a rejig was required in low earth orbit with Soyuz MS-18 moving from the Rasvet module over to the Nyorka module to make way for MS-19 which is launching on October 5th. At 1312 coordinated universal time on September 30th Dragon C-208 of the CRS-23 mission departed the Harmony forward port, performed its deorbit manoeuvre and a few hours later it re-entered the atmosphere and splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean. Enough jogging about, let's look at some launches. Zhilin 12D launched atop the return to flight mission of the Kuai Zhao 1A rocket from the Zhiquan Space Launch Complex in China at 0619 UTC on the 27th of September. The Earth observation satellite was launched to an unknown low Earth orbit on behalf of the Chuanggang Satellite Technologies Company. Another launch from China last Monday saw the Cheyenne 10 satellite head for orbit atop this Long March 3BE and 0820 UTC from the Zhi Chang Satellite Launch Center. Catalogued a few hours after the launch, the payload was sent into a 177 km by 40,104 km geostationary transfer orbit. It was confirmed after this was spotted that the payload experienced abnormal operating conditions during the launch and the mission was declared a failure. Let's keep the spirits high though as launching just a few hours later at 1812 UTC from Slick 3E at a very foggy Vandenberg Space Force space, this United Launch Alliance Atlas V with a 4 meter fairing, no solid rocket boosters and a single engine on the centre upper stage carried the Landsat 9 satellite up to a sun synchronous orbit marking the 300th Atlas launch from Vandenberg. On board Landsat 9 are many instruments that will be able to monitor the Earth in a total 11 bands of light from visible light all the way down to shortwave infrared as well as thermal imaging capabilities. Look into her face, determination in her eyes. She won't give up a quit or for a little fashion lies. Films on some expectation. This girl's a fascination. And here is your space weather with Dr. Tamita Scove. Space weather this week is definitely holding our attention. As we take a look at the Earth-facing disk, you can see bright regions in the north and bright regions in the south. Those two bands right there are telltale signs that solar cycle 25 has really taken hold. I mean, look at the sun. It looks like it's lit up like a Christmas tree. And on the far side, we're seeing a lot of activity as well. So this is good news for people who are looking for solar cycle 25 to really take off. In fact, the solar flux has now jumped up into the triple digits once again again and it may actually stay there or stay close to there this time around and be like that for quite some time. Now as we take a look at region 2871 this is really good news as it begins to rotate off of the west limb. Wham! Right there on the 28th it fires off a solar storm. Now it looks like the solar storm's going west of earth but coronagraph views show us that this thing is actually earth directed and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Meanwhile we also have region 2880. This is the new 
big flare player on the Earth-facing disk. As a matter of fact, we even have a 5% chance of an X-class flare from this region right now. It's been growing explosively over the past couple days, and if it continues to grow like this, I guarantee you we'll see some big flares from this one. So we're all keeping our eyes on. Meanwhile, we also have a few other regions, including region 2877. That region also is an M-flare player, so we're keeping our eyes on that as well, and we could see a lot more activity in the days to come. For more details on this week's space weather, including when and where Aurora can be seen with that Earth-directed solar storm, and how those big M-flare players might affect you, come check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. Before the show ends this week, let's thank all of our YouTube members, the citizens of tomorrow. They contribute financially to the show every month and we are very grateful for their support. If you feel like joining the Escape Velocity Orbital, Suborbital or Ground Support Citizens, then head on over to youtube.com forward slash tomorrow forward slash join or just press that join button that is right next to the subscribe button. Another question I've seen floating around is whether our Discord server is open to anyone, and it is. You don't have to pay any money at all. Just click the link in the description and join our community today to have some awesome conversations about space. That's it from me. We'll be back next week. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and goodbye.